squid. In my previous video, we discussed survival time analysis, which is a group of statistical methods we use to investigate the time it takes for an event of interest to occur. So for example, a typical example would be in a clinical trial where the event of interest is death. And we mentioned statistical methods like the Kaplan-Meier curve, which is the topic of today's video. So in this video, we will discuss the main concepts behind the Kaplan-Meier curve. I will give you some simple guidelines on how to interpret the Kaplan-Meier curve and some things to watch out for when you're actually looking at a Kaplan-Meier curve. So if you're ready, let's dive in. So let's start by finding out what is a Kaplan-Meier curve. So this survival curve is used to graphically represent the survival rate or survival function. In the x-axis, we have time, and in the y-axis, we plot probability of survival or the survival rate. It's as easy as that. So how do we actually interpret the Kaplan-Meier curve? We will now go through a series of guidelines on the best way or an easy way to interpret the Kaplan-Meier curve. So, of course, step one is to check the axes. So to interpret the Kaplan-Meier curve, we first need to look at the axis. The horizontal axis represents time, usually measured in months and years. And the vertical axis, the y-axis, represents the estimated probability of an event. So the first step is to identify what is the event of interest and the units of measurement along the axis. For example, we could be looking at time to relapse in months and the survival probability would be the probability of relapsing. Next, we have to check the shape of the curve. So at a first glance, the shape of a Kaplan-Meier curve can already give you a lot of information. A steeper slope indicates a higher event rate. If the event is death, then this means worse survival. A flatter slope indicates a lower event rate. In other words, a better survival. And of course, we can always have a look at survival probability at specific time points. For example, what is the probability of a patient surviving 12 months after being diagnosed with lung cancer? So at specific time points, you can estimate the survival probability by locating the time point on the horizontal axis and dropping a vertical line to the curve. And then we just read the survival probability from the vertical axis. For example, here we see the probability of a patient relapsing after 12 or more months is 85%. In other words, 15% of patients relapse within a year or less. The lengths of the horizontal lines along the x-axis of serial times represent the survival duration for that interval. It's important to know that survival time intervals are defined by the event happening. So in this case, the relapse of a patient marks the end of an interval. So every time a patient relapses, we drop down a level, basically. In this example, in the first year, the survival probability dropped 15%. However, in the second year, the survival probability dropped from 85 to 40%, so it dropped 45%. In other words, the probability of surviving the first year after being diagnosed is 85%, but the probability of surviving more than two years is 40%. Well, actually here we're not talking about survival. The event of interest is not death, it's relapsing. So the probability of relapsing in more than two years is 40%. So usually there's a 60% chance you will relapse in two years or less. So again, the survival time intervals are defined by the event happening. 
But what if we do not know if the event happened? What happens with censored data? So as we saw in my previous video, data is censored or censoring is used when we just don't know if the event happened or not. For example, if a patient dropped out of a study. So what do we do with censored data? Well, the answer is that we just represent it as tick marks. So there will be tick marks along our Kaplan-Meier curve and they just represent data that was, or patients that were censored. So since we don't know if the event occurred or not, we cannot terminate that interval. So the interval will not be terminated. We will not drop down a level. We will just add a tick mark that just indicates that an event or a patient was censored. As you probably know, we can also plot multiple curves representing different groups to compare their shapes and patterns. If the curves are parallel, it suggests that the groups have similar survival rates. If the curves diverge or cross, it indicates differences in survival between the groups. Another interesting metric is median survival. Median survival is the time, expressed in months or years, when half of the patients are expected to be alive. It means that the chance of surviving beyond that time is 50%. And it can be a very useful summary measure as it gives you an approximate indication of survival. Median survival can be read from the Kaplan-Meier curve at the 50% survival mark, on the y-axis. So if you draw a vertical line, you can compare the median survival between two treatments. So here we can see some examples where the median survival is very similar or very different. Or perhaps the two treatments seem to be doing very different. Here we see the pink drug is doing worse. Patients seem to relapse much earlier um, since the curve is steeper but at the end of the day the median survival or the time when 50% of patients relapse is very similar between groups. Nice so to finish off I will just give you some general considerations and common pitfalls when interpreting Kaplan-Meier curves so things to be aware of or to watch out to avoid misinterpretations. So again, it's important to check out the shape of the curve. Curves that have very many small steps usually have a higher number of participating patients, whereas curves with very large steps usually have a limited number of patients and are not as accurate. So always check the number of individuals that are actually enrolled in the study. And in relation to this, the amount of censored data and the distribution of censored patients is also important. On one hand, a lot of censored patients means less data to calculate uh, probabilities from, which in turn means less accurate estimates. But also looking at this from a more clinical point of view, you might ask yourself why there are so many censored patients. So how was the study carried out or if the treatment was so ineffective that so many patients left the study to try different therapies. And on the other hand, a curve that does not have any censored data at all can be a bit suspicious. Nice, so I think that is it for today. I hope you liked this brief introduction to Kaplan-Meier curves and how to interpret them. Please let me know if you have any comments or feedback or questions. I really appreciate all your comments and support. So do let me know. And that is it. So see you in the next one.